So this is, my, this is the title of my message this morning, Word of God Speak. That's a little play on words off of an old song. Word of God Speak, let it pour down like rain. Open my eyes to see your majesty. Amen. So Word of God Speak is, is the title of the message. And we're going to be reading out of 2 Kings chapter 22. <coughs> and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. So here we go. 2 Kings chapter 22, starting in verse 1. It says... Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 30 and one years, or 31 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah of Bosca. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David, his father. Now, I just got to take a little moment. I'm trying to set up context for you, and I might forget if I don't stop here. One of the things that we need to understand about David, if we're going to understand some things about, about the, the time frame of the kings or the early years of Israel's history. So we're talking B.C. time right here. Okay, and Many of you are already uh, familiar with the, some of the story because I've explained it many times in service. But, you know, there was a time when there was no nation called Israel. And that God called a man named Abraham who lived in what we call Iraq now, southern Iraq. He called him out of there and he said, I want you to come out of your father's house and I'm going to make you a great nation. And God did that. Abraham listened and God made a nation out of him. Abraham had a, had a son, amen. His name was Isaac, right? And Isaac ended up having two sons. One, they were twins. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Isaac had Isaac had. Yeah, Isaac had two sons. They were twins, Jacob and Esau. And later in Jacob's life, God changed his name to Israel. So that's where the name Israel comes from. He changed. And it's very important that you understand that too because the word Jacob kind of means deceiver, which all of us in our own way are born in that way. Um, but then the name Israel means a prince of God or one that will rule with God. And you need to understand that God changes your character and he changes your name when you get saved. Amen. But then it, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, had 12 sons. Amen. And those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. All right. And so after the 12 tribes of Israel ended up, you know, the story of Egypt, and then they ended up back in the land that God promised them, there was a first a time frame known as the judges. Okay, real quick, I'm not going to overdo all this, but Samson was a judge. I'll remember the story of Samson. That's one you'd probably remember. So after the time frame of the judges, we entered into the time frame of the kings, right? The people originally, they said, hey, we want to be like the other nations. You know, that was a problem that Israel always had. They wanted to be like everybody else. And it's important that we talk about that just for a second because guess what? That kind of problem still lives on today. People still want to be like everybody else. Whatever the coolest trend is, whatever's trending on social media, whatever, I'm not saying all of y'all are like that. I'm just trying to say that spirit is in the world. That's the only point I'm really trying to make. I know some of y'all are like old leathernecks and y'all could care less what they say and trend is on social media. And I, pre I can appreciate that. But that spirit, I'm trying to make a point, is still alive and well on the earth. And it's enticing people to become or to look like the world around them. Does that make sense what I'm trying? to say well Israel was no, was was the same way back then but the problem is is that the world around them were worshiping false gods that's one of the main reasons that God wanted to create a nation after he divided the nations because he wanted a presence of himself on the earth a presence where his light could shine in the midst of darkness and God still wants his light to shine in darkness and he wants the light of God which is Jesus Christ that was sent from earth that now lives in you to shine through you, amen, so God's plan is always remaining the same, right, and so he has this nation called Israel, and they said, we want a king, and God said, oh, so you don't want me to be your king, okay, well, and you know, God didn't tell him, and a lot of times you won't realize it, but you start demanding something, and you don't even realize it, because God's not going to try to yell over you, 
You understand what I'm saying? God's like, be still and know that I am God. So you want something in your heart and in your life, if you would reach out to me and call out to me and not necessarily demand to me what you're going to get from me, but instead inquire of me, then guess what? Whenever my desire meets up with your desire, it's a beautiful thing because I'll give you the desires of your heart as long as they're following according to my will. But many times we want our own will, and so we cry out, give us a king, right? Just like many times Christians cry out and they say they want something, right? Y'all, we ain't going to go down that rabbit trail. You know what I'm talking about. There's how we can fill in some blanks, right? All right. And so nevertheless, they cried out, give us a king. Well, see, what they didn't know was that God was preparing a king. He had young David, King David, was a little shepherd boy. And I know I've told you all the story, but it's real important that you understand. Young David was in the sheep field. He was a teenage boy at the time, taking care of the sheep. But he, had a, he, had this, he was a musician, too. Dude, David was awesome. But anyway, let's not get too much into that because I could go on and on about David. David was awesome, man. But look, he, at, at his young age, he, when he's not fighting bears and when he's not fighting lions, and he ain't scared, dude. He's talking about game bread. This dude was game. He was ready to go. But, but, but besides that, he also wasn't scared to strum a, a harp. And to write lyrics that accompanied the melody that he was, I think I said that right, melodies and lyrical accompaniment. And so he would sit there and he would strum that harp and he would write the psalms. King David would write the psalms, right? And, and, and so God was preparing him. And the reason I know that this is significant is because when David fell into sin with Bathsheba and God sent Nathan the prophet to correct him through Nathan the prophet, he told David, he said, I took you, I get tore up every time I think about it. I took you from the sheep coat, meaning from the pasture where you were taking care of them sheep. I took you from that place and I made you king over my people. And then he begins to describe Bathsheba as a little ewe lamb that you took. This man had one little lamb. He tells a story. He, he makes it an allegory. He says, he says, there was a traveler that came from another. I didn't plan on getting into this, but it's too good to leave away. There was a traveler that came from another land, and, he, and, and, and there was a man in the town, and he had one little ewe lamb, and what the king had a big old flock of lambs. And he went to the man that had the one little ewe lamb. He said, hey, give me your lamb so I can sacrifice it for the traveler so that I can be hospitable to him. And David said, oh, yeah, what's his name so I can take care of business with him? I'm going to give him a what for and show him that that kind of stuff don't go on in my kingdom. And Nathan, the prophet, says, you're the man. You're the man because you took Uriah the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba, and you took her for yourself. And then David began to repent. So we know that story, and many times, well, look, David, David had already taken Bathsheba, but then he also had her husband killed. So that's a big old mess. I mean, that's Jerry Springer stuff right there, my friend. That's the kind of stuff that the police force, they just love digging into that, right? And then the, and then the TV loves to sensationalize that. That's, that's the next, what, what was that, Casey Anthony story on the, the here you go. Okay, but the, point, but the point to all of this is this. Is that so? When we hear that story and we think of David, we're like, "How in the world are you gonna sit here in this scripture and say, which he did, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in all the way of David his father? How, like, what in the world? Why would we want kings walking in the way of David his father? David his father stole Uriah the Hittite's wife." impregnated her when he found out she was pregnant and his conspiracy was going to be revealed he turned around I mean it wasn't bad enough dude why don't you just come clean I mean like once the gig is up why don't you just come clean no you're gonna have you're gonna have because look look if we're honest with one another whenever we fall into sin we we get hardened we get deceived we don't want our sin to be exposed do you want your sin to be exposed? Do you want us to play a video of all your mess up on the screen for everybody to see? No, we don't want that. But sometimes if the Lord is allowing something to be revealed, the worser thing is to make it even worser, right? I mean, <laughs> I know that that's not right. I did it on purpose. But the point is, is that the, it makes it worse whenever we're trying to manipulate a situation and we think we're making it better. Dude, what are you doing? And so when we hear that story, we think, why would we want the kings of Israel to walk after the ways of their father, David? Because David had one love. Yeah, he might have loved women, but he had one love. David loved 
God, and he refused to lift up his heart to an idol. Anything that was going to stand as far as idolatrous worship or false gods that were going to get in the way of serving God. David knew, listen, you got to understand something. We, they lived in a world where the nations around them were obviously worshiping false gods. They had false religion all around them. Now, I got to tell you that this thing has not died. The same devil that was alive then is alive now. The same devil that charades and masquerades himself in false religion is still alive now. I could sit here and list off a litany of them, but none of y'all in here serve Buddha or Allah or Krishna, so it's not going to do me any good to go there. But let me just say this. Anything that will get between you and the Lord can become an idol in your life. It will begin to try to steal God's presence and love from you. And so guess what? The Lord wants you and I to be like David spiritually, where we would not offer up our heart to an idol. Does that mean we'll never fall short of the glory of God? No, it does not. But let me tell you something. When you fall short of the glory of God, the last thing that you're supposed to do is to try to start fixing stuff in your own strength and according to your own wisdom. And what you're supposed to do is ultimately what David did when the Lord spoke to him and repent and surrender to the will of God. Amen. And so when we talk about Josiah, now listen, you got to understand. So so here's Israel. I got to set this up for you. We're going to be getting into the Kings and Chronicles on Wednesday nights coming up before long. But just so that you understand, that it's a, it's a historic, these are historical books that chronicle the lives of these kings. You got to understand there were hundreds of kings through these time frames. All right, now real quick, I'm just trying to break it down to give you some context. So, uh, so Israel says, give us a king. And God's like, well, I had a really good one for you, but you're not patient enough to wait for him. So instead, I'm going to give you what you want. Here's Saul. Y'all know the story of Saul. Saul ends up dying. David becomes king, okay, right? David ends up having a son named Solomon. Y'all remember Solomon, right? I could go on and on about Solomon for hours. We don't really have time to do that. But the Bible says of Solomon that he was the wisest man in the Bible. Now, I got to tell you that that can be confusing because Solomon made some big old boo-boos, my friend. Way worse than his daddy, David. See, originally, sometimes we find ourselves caught up in a bind whenever we find ourselves knee-deep in the midst of sin. But in reality, if we're honest with one another, once we're a believer, the Holy Spirit warned us long before we ever ventured down that road and walked through that door. He was already contending with us and speaking with our hearts before we ever showed up to the place where the problem was going to occur. And, and, and that's essentially what is going on there, but, but what ends up happening, and so what I meant by that is this, is that the word of God was clear to Israel, do not intermarry with their women. In other words, God was saying, listen, and, it's very, and this still lives on for you today. <laughs> I've heard of one couple, one couple that I know, I'm sure there's more, but one couple that I know, Paul and Lisa Wilson, okay, they were sweethearts in high school, She was born and raised in a Pentecostal home where they spoke in other tongues. Okay, Paul Wilson was a heathen. She liked Paul, and obviously Paul loved her because somehow she started dating him, and Paul got saved, and they still married, as far as I know, living for the Lord. But that don't happen very often. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that your ministry, single lady or single man, is not to go find yourself a worldly woman or a worldly man and to convert them to make them your husband. That is not the will of the Lord. The Lord said in the Old Testament, do not marry their women. And the reason why was not because God don't, God hate, you know, it's because God knew that they were going to, those women were going to draw his people's hearts away from him. Just like, I'm just being real with you. If you do marry an unbeliever, you, you're, if, you, if you were a believer and you married an unbeliever, now you're in covenant with the unbeliever. So just because the, the Bible says in the letter to the Corinthians, if the unbeliever wants to stay, then you let him stay. Amen. If the unbeliever wants to go, like, now you can't be trying to run him off. You can't be trying to run that man off or you can't be trying to run that woman off. 
Oh, they ain't living the way I want them to, so I'm going to make life bad for them. I'm going to get them out of here. No, 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 no. That ain't, because see, that's not how the Lord works. The Lord, I, this is none of my message, but some, for some reason somebody needs to hear this. Listen, that's not how the Lord works. The Lord wants to deal with you and contend with you and humble you and give you wisdom on how to respond and to act towards, how to be Jesus towards that unbelieving spouse. But the problem is, is because the person's an unbeliever and now you're a believer, now you're living in the same house under the same roof with that unbeliever and there's a chance that that unbeliever can begin to draw you away from the things of God, all right? And that happens, that happens a lot. That's why God did not want his people intermarrying with them, but Solomon, see, that was the point. He warned him along before he ever got there. It's just like the Lord said, don't go to that person's house. I ever tell you all the story before when I was in Holland? Probably didn't, but I went to survival school. It's kind of embarrassing, but it is what it is. I was in Holland. I went to survival school. I was a new Christian, right? And so we get on the plane, and we're in business class, and so all the alcohol is free. And we're flying eight, eight hours, I think, from New York City to uh, Amsterdam, uh, Holland, okay? And all these guys that I'm working with in the oil field, like, I'm talking straight up yahoos, my friend. Like, all these dudes were, like, bad, like I used to be, but now I'm a Christian. And so, I mean, look, at some point, and I didn't drink a drop of alcohol on the plane because I was just like, man, I don't drink no more. I'm a Christian, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And they were laughing, and they were clowning me, and they had all these little European people on the plane, and they were just so enamored with these Americans, loudmouth Americans getting drunk. And, dude, I'm telling you, Back in the day, I would have fit in with these boys just right. But, and, and I didn't even have confidence in the Lord. Had I had confidence like I have now, I believe by the grace of God, the Lord would have rose up on the inside of me, and I would have said, Sir, why you got your buzz going on, and you over here laughing and happy? But guess what? When you get home and you sleep it off, you got problems in your life, sir. You got problems in your family. You got problems going on. And for the most part, you're just trying to drink all this stuff away. Anyway, that's what I would have told him. And I would have been an expert on it because I know because I've lived it. Okay, but anyway, that, was, that wasn't it. I was timid, and I wasn't, like, flowing in my little thing. And I can remember this little girl from Belgium. She was thought these Americans were so cool. And she's like, well, why aren't you? And when I told her, I said, I'm a Christian. She rolled her eyes. You know, I can still remember all that. That was way back. That was a long time ago. Anyway, so all this happens, and the first night, I'm thinking to myself, man, I need to see the... I need to see what Holland's all about. I mean, I'm in Europe, okay? And so we, so they plan a trip. The first, the, like the first night, once we settle, we got to we plan a trip. School survival school starts the next day, I believe. And so they got a bus, and the bus is going to bring us to a place called Rotterdam because we were actually out in the countryside in this little place called Briel, I think it was what it was called. So we get on this bus. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to this little town called Rotterdam, and I'm, they're going to go do their thing, and I'm just going to walk around. I'm telling you right now, dude, it was like, a, a, like an animal trap. Now, did it have to be an animal trap? No, it didn't. But that's what ended up happening. When I got on the bus, very distinctly, the Lord said, get off the bus. In my spirit, man, I heard it, dude. It was like it was loud as day. Get off the bus. But like a little timid child that doesn't know what to do, I ignored the voice and I walked to, and I sat down on the seat and there we rode to Rotterdam. And see, I didn't know this until later, the driver of the bus had already made a deal with the owner of the club. And so what he did was he pulled straight up to the front of the club and everybody piled out of the van. And everybody got in a line that was already there for the people that were waiting to get in the club. And again, like a timid little child, I stood in the line. And by the time I get to the line, they're here, you got to pay, buy five tickets, and it'll buy you five drinks. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to drink a Coke. <laughs> by the time I got to the place where you paid for the five tickets, I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just put a little Jack Daniels in the Coke. And by the time I'm sitting down, it all doesn't even seem that bad until all the women start coming out, sitting at the table, and then they start dancing, and they ain't got no rules over there, so they ain't got no clothes on. And then you find out that it's not just that, it's a brothel, and it gets even worse than that because they're actually holding these women's passports, so they were probably sex trafficking, slave tra I mean, that was back in the day when you didn't even know about all that stuff. And listen... It could have been a lot worse, but let me just say this. It wasn't good. Yeah. 
because that night I drank, and that night I did other things, you know, and the point that I'm trying to make is get off the bus. The word of the Lord told Solomon, get off the, yeah, get off the bus, Christian. Look, the word of the Lord told Solomon way before Solomon was ever born, don't marry their women. But what did Solomon do? He married all kinds of those women. Then the Bible says that Solomon began to build altars for their gods. There were some bad gods involved in that. Because of Solomon's disobedience and sin, you need to understand this. I'm just giving you a Sunday school lesson this morning. Because of that, God ripped, the, divided the kingdom in two. Between ten tribes in the north and two tribes in the south. The northern tribes were called Israel. The southern tribes were called Judah. Judah was made up of the tribe of Judah and also the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin is where Saul came from. Judah is where King David came from. Benjamin and, and Judah stuck together. But it, and the Levites were mixed between the two. Those were the priests. But the ten tribes of Israel up in the north. And so when you move through the kings, I, I'm trying to, I know I've given you a lot of information, but I was trying to set up the story for you. When you move through the kings, it says, and this king reigned 30 years. Years, and he did that which was evil in the sight of his God. Okay, and then and then and then and and then you'll have and, and he says this king reigned in Israel and he did evil in the sight of his God. And while he and in the fifth year of that king that reigned in Israel, King so and so reigned in Judah and he did that which was evil in the sight of his God. And many of them see after after Solomon. After, the, king, after the, the kingdom really was not divided till Solomon died, but after the kingdom was divided, the first king that took the northern part, his name was Jeroboam. The one that took the lower part, his name was Rehoboam. They would sound like they were twins, but they weren't even brothers. Jeroboam was a general in the army, and he just took it by force. He said, nope, these t top ten are going to be mine. But listen, what happened was, and I'm, this is a reason that I'm saying this to you, because I'm trying to build the context for you, for you to understand the world that they were living in, okay? Jer Jeroboam made two golden calves, because, see, he was concerned that in the northern parts of the country that he was over that whenever it came time for the men to worship, they would do what the Word of God said, and they would go to Jerusalem, and they would worship the Lord in Jerusalem, and that what would happen is, is that he would lose those people, that they would leave him, and they would revolt against him. So what he did was, he made two golden calves. Like in Egypt, you remember the story in Egypt, which had taken place before? He made two golden calves. He put one in uh, Bethel, and he put one uh, I'm sorry, yeah, he put one above the Sea of Galilee and he put one in Bethel, all right? And he said, here, O Israel, here is your God. Here, here O Israel, here is your God that delivered you from Egypt. Okay, d do you see the audacity of what he did? How bad this is? This is really, really bad. Okay, well, that's just the beginning of time because hundreds of years. The, the, the time frame of the kings lasts at least 600 to 800 years or more. OK, and and all and, and so you have king after king after they die, a new king becomes king. And what you're seeing as you're re turning the pages in, in first and second Chronicles and also in first and second Kings is you see the king of Israel and he dies and another one takes his place. And, and then you see a king in Judah. And sometimes it gets confusing because you don't know if they're talking about a king from Judah. I mean, it tells you, but you, you lose track. And the point is, is that most of these kings on both sides aren't serving the Lord. And, 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 you know, in, but in Judah, for the most, a little bit more than Israel, they did. They tried to serve the Lord a little bit more. All right. And so you, you've heard some of the stories of like King Ahab and some of these other bad guys. There were some really bad ones. And in, in the southern kingdom, there was a guy named Manasseh. And he, and he was actually the son of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. Jehoshaphat was a good king in the southern, in the southern por portion of the country. But, but Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, was wicked. He was like the alter ego of Ahab. Ahab was in Israel, the northern part. He, uh, Manasseh was in the lower part. <laughs> and look, Manasseh had made, had really caused a lot of corruption in Judah. And so the people had been worshiping false gods for years. Manasseh was king for 55 years. So what I need you to understand, too, is this, is that as time goes forward and you're seeing and, and people are living in a certain uh, environment, 
they begin to believe that this is the norm. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that after 55 years, after 60 years, you got old people getting old and you got new young people coming up and they're being introduced. This is the religion of the Israelites and they don't even know what's right from wrong. They don't even know what's really God and what's not God. And what I'm trying to tell you is, real quick, and then we're going to get into the story, I want you to know that I believe that this same kind of thing is happening in the atmosphere of the church. I don't care if anybody believes me or not. I mean, I want people to believe me. But it's not my job to convince people. I'm telling you when I read the word of God and I see what happened in the Old Testament, I understand that these very things are being repeated in the New Testament. Are people putting a share of poles, and we'll get into that in a moment, in the house of God? Are people putting altars to Baal to burn incense to Baal in the house of God? No, but they just soon because there's all kinds of other things that are coming into the house of God and they're embracing. Uh, Eastern kinds of forms of worship, and they're integrating it with Christianity. I mean, people don't like it when you start saying names, but look, Rick Warren coined the phrase Chrislam. You know, all of these things are taking place where there's this mixture that's happening, and it's not, and they're mixing psychology with theology, and they're mixing all it. This kind of stuff is knee deep in the midst of the modern church. And, and, and I'm just letting you know the reason why this is starting to happen is because the people of God are moving away from the word of God. And that's really what our message is about this morning. Word of God speak. So I want you to know that the, the, the environment that we're living in, whether or not people can receive this or even see it yet, I'm, I'm just here to tell you real quick, that's what's going on. And it's very similar to what was going on in the Old Testament. All right, so now we're talking about Josiah. And Josiah became king when he was eight years old, and he reigned for 31 years. And he walked in all the way of David his father, and he turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, so that means that he would have been 18 plus 8 is 26. All right, but look, if you go back to 2 Chronicles, there's some other numbers in there that shows that maybe when he was about 16, he started to do some reforming already. He started to want to serve the Lord. Now, how would have he known about these things? I'm, I've got to try to let you understand something, too. So the, the books of the kings and the chronicles are being written. They're keeping, ta- they're keeping a record of the chronicles of the kings, and so the kings have access to that. Hey, could you go and pull me that scroll um, whenever Hezekiah built the pool of uh, Shalom to feed water up in, into the city so that we could. Could you go get that scroll where, where, uh, on the Chronicles where, where Hezekiah did that? Because my name's King Josiah, and, and I need to go ahead and review that to see what the kings before me did. Well, along when he's reading on that, he also can read in there that Hezekiah started some of the reform himself. And so these kings had access to what kings before them had done, and they hear the story, and they're like, well, man, look, so all of these things that we see going on in the land, the kings, some of the kings before me, they said that this wasn't good, and they began to tear down the altars to the false gods, and they began to make changes in the kingdom. But look, whenever he's 26, it really, the story really thickens, okay? So this is when he is, and when he's 26 year old, years old in the 18th year, that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshullam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord. So he sends him to the church, right? Or the, or the temple, right? Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, so go talk to the priest, that he may sum or count the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house. So there you go. All you construction workers, all you carpenters, you you, you should be ready to hear this. So Manasseh has been the king. Manasseh is not only bringing idolatry into land, nobody cares about the house of the Lord. Let, Let that thing fall apart, man. I mean, or where sin is. I mean, have you ever seen the, 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 the situations that people that are knee-deep in sin have found themselves, the circumstances that they sin is Sin is dirty, my friend. 
it'll make you not care about nothing but it. All right? I mean, there's always extremes. And so the house of the Lord's being broke down. Well, under Josiah's rule, he's like, no, we need to start saving some money. We need to get some work done. We need to repair the house of the Lord. Amen? All right, so they, they bring the money. And so unto the carpenters and the builders and the masons to buy timber, hewn stone, or cut stone to repair the house. Howbeit, there was no reckoning. In other words, they didn't pay attention to how much to count the money and this, that, and the other thing because the carpenters were trustworthy. <laughs> That's another story for another time, right? You got to be careful who you hire these days, right? They might take your money and not show back up to do the work. But they didn't have to worry about that because they, were, they wanted to, to make things right too, okay, of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. You see that? So if you're a carpenter, if you're in construction business, deal faithfully with your customers. Amen. It'll go a long way. Amen. Amen. And Hilkiah, the high priest said unto Shaphan and the scribe, I have found, I want you to get this. This is the biggest part of my message when it comes to this part of the story. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Now, does that not kind of jolt you a little bit? I mean, you got to think about this. You found the book of the law? Like you did you, you didn't even know it was lost? Like, how long this, how long this book been gone? Like, that's your Bible, man. Where, where's your Bible? It's been, up on the, it's been up on the shelf, man. It kind of fell behind. I had it on the bed, and it fell behind the headboard, and I hadn't been able to find it. You know how many times I let, back in the old days, I used to leave my Bible at the church. You know, I carried it in there. And they're like, Matt, your Bible been here for a month now. And I didn't have all these Bible apps on my phone back then. So straight up, when I left my Bible at the church for the month, that means I had not cracked the Word of God in a month. Do what you want with that. Go ahead, Mike, judge me. <laughs> all right. So he says, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan, the scribe, came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, law that he rent, or he tore his clothes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray, O oh Lord God, that you'd give us wisdom and understanding, O oh Lord God, that you would help us to understand what you desire to speak to your church this morning, your people called by your name, Lord. Let it sink deep down inside of our hearts, O oh Lord God, and let us get an understanding and revelation of how important your word is to our walk, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. From this point moving forward, I'm just going to stop reading right here, but I need you to understand, and I had some notes that I was going to bring, and I forgot to print them up, so we're just going to shoot from the hip. What I want you to know is this, is that God had a plan to wake his people up. And from this point moving forward, if we read it, and I recommend you go back and read the rest of chapter 22 tonight and also read chapter 23 because it's all about Josiah and his reform. But what ends up happening is, is that whenever this book of the law is read to him and he begins to tear his clothes, he goes on a tear, my friend. He goes into the land and he begins to realize all of the things that are going on. He goes to the house of the Lord and he says, there's, there's altars for Baal in the house of God. There's Asherah poles. You don't even know what an Asherah pole is. They call them groves. It's pretty disgusting. It's shaped like a male, male's private area because that was the form of worship that they did. See, the thing of it is, is this, is that whether you realize it or not, you can still be worshiping the same old devils that they were worshiping back then if you all bound up in lust and you worship in lust and you worship in sexuality and you worship in all that stuff and everything that society is breeding right now is all about sexuality, all about lust, all about the homosexuality and this sexuality and si sexuality identity and sexuality preference and sexuality this and all of this kind of stuff. It's in the music. It's it's on the TV, it's on the, 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 sit, it's on the news, it's, it's on the commercials. Everywhere you turn, you're clicking through it, and there it is. 
And, and so what I'm trying to tell you is that he walks in there. He's like, they got altars to Baal up in there. I didn't even know that. What in the world is going on? The book's been hidden. And now you read me the book. Get these altars out of here. Get these groves out of here. Get these statues out of here. And he brought them to the field in Kidron, and he burned them. And then he took, the, he took those Asherah poles, and he burned them, and he ground them up into powder. And he said, go ahead, load that powder up and put it in a sack, and let's go ahead and let's walk over here to the graveyard. To all these people that worshiped and put up with this stuff. All these people that allowed these things to take place in the kingdom of God. Go on, servant man, and I want you to take handfuls of this dust that comes from the Meshire poles, and I want you to sprinkle it on their graves. I want you to defile their graves, because this is what they chose to live with. They allowed false gods in the house of God. They allowed false worship towards false gods, and God is angry with his people, and he began to just tell them to do that. And so he, they, he's breaking down altars, but then even better than that, he said, it ain't good enough just to stop here. He went to a city called Manasseh. He went to a city called Ephraim. And he started tearing down the altars in those places that were used to burn incense to false gods and to burn sacrifice to false gods. And he began to tear them down. He began to crush them and burn them. Then he ends up in Bethel, where that little cow, one of them cows had always been. He ends up over there in Bethel, and he says, listen, he's about to turn. He's like, look, this is where it all started right here with Jeroboam. When he made that, that, that golden calf, however many hundreds of years ago that was, we need to go over there and we need to do, do business with these guys. And he's about to leave, and it, but before they even tear down the altar, he sees like another grave, some tombs up in there. He said, go, pull them bones out of there. Pull them bones out of there. Most people believe that was the bones of the priest. Pull them bones out of those graves, and I want you to take those bones, and I want you to burn them on this altar to this false god that, that all these priests that are dead and buried inside of those tombs, uh, they, they put up with it. They allowed it. They were sanctioned to, to burn sacrifice to false gods. Go ahead and take their bones and burn them on these altars. And so they burnt them bones. They ground that up in powder. They spread that garbage all over the place. They said the land is defiled. I mean, you think that the people didn't think this man was crazy? I'm just saying, like, you know, they, people flip through, like, no, this is bad stuff. Like, this, this king's on a tear, my friend, 26 years old, young, got a zeal for the Lord, amen, been king since he was eight, started hearing things having to do with God, but then when he hears the word of the Lord read to him, he tears his clothes and he realizes, oh my goodness, what has been going on in the kingdom of God? And I just, I'm just saying, listen, does it seem radical? Absolutely. It don't seem it, my friend. It is radical. But I'm just trying to make a point that, look, how complacent can we all become? How complacent can we all become with the things of God? That we just be, oh, it's okay, my friend. You, you know, look, it's understandable. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's understandable that people <laughs> don't worship God properly out of ignorance. That's understandable because the devil is a deceiver. Okay, and we need to have compassion on people. We need to be careful that when we find somebody that might be caught up in false religion, that we don't just punch them in the eye with, with our words. We got to understand that, like, if you, I'm just saying, like, some, I didn't share with y'all that I, that I was born and raised Catholic, so I can't talk about that, but I use Catholicism as an example. I mean, like, if I'm having an encounter with a cat, you do it the way you want to do it. That's between you and the Lord. I'm just telling you that sometimes you're not going to get to, don't come cry on my shoulder if you don't get the results you're looking for because of the fact that you're just being rude, okay? Um, and you punch somebody in the eye, all right? Because, you know, the Lord showed me a long time ago, and I was like, Lord, did I mess that dude up by saying what I did in Sunday school? And the Lord said, it depends on what you want to, what you're trying to get out of this deal. I'm like, what you mean, Lord? He's like, well, do you want to be right or do you want to lead people to me? <laughs> Because if you're just looking to be right, yeah, just go on. Keep rolling like you're rolling. But if you want to lead people to me, then you need to understand some things. Because, I mean, you and listen, that doesn't mean God can never use that. Because some of y'all, y'all's personality can be very blunt and very dry. And guess what? The prophets, many times, their personality was that way. So I'm not trying to sit here and mold you into being what you're supposed to be or how you're supposed to do it. If the Lord has made you blunt, he probably wants to use your bluntness, okay? But at the same time, you at least need to mix that 
and have your speech seasoned with salt and understand that people are going to be able to receive. I'm not trying to tell you to water down your message. I'm not trying to tell you not to speak the truth. But at the same time, if you walk up to someone who the first time don't know nothing and they've been living in Jerusalem since Manasseh was the king and they think that Baal worship is normal in the house of the Lord, then you can expect that if you start tearing down the altars and burning people's bones on the altar, that they're going to be like, oh my gosh, what are you talking about? The same thing like, man, you're in false religion, dude. You pray to Mary, you're in false religion. Everything you just said was true. The Bible says there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. You're not to pray through Mary. But that dude may not know that. So the Lord might give you a different approach is what I'm trying to say. At the same time, be led by the Lord because I've seen before where people have used blunt language and said, man, you need to get away from that. Right? I mean, (laughs) I don't know if I... Anyway, I mean, I remember one time Robert and I, some girl called us up and said, I need prayer. I got the spirit of uh, Lil Wayne in my house. Lil Wayne is, now y'all laughing, but Lil, he was a a demon. You think Lil Wayne ain't demon possessed? Do I even have to try to convince you on Lil Wayne that he's demon possessed? I might not be able to convince you on Harry Styles, whoever that is, or Whoever that other dude was that sang at the Super Bowl that time, that he's got that little smooth voice. I might not be able to convince you on that. I don't remember what his name was. Huh? What was his name? Yeah. I might not be able to convince you on him, but I might not, not have to work hard to convince you on Lil Wayne. Anyway, she's over here pumping Lil Wayne up in her living room. I mean, we walk in there, and she got her son's playing the game. I think it was, what was, the, what was them games where they, Grand Theft Auto. Her kid ain't but three, four years old, four or five years old. He's playing Grand Theft Auto. They, uh, in the video itself, in the game itself, I'm pretty sure they're hitting bongs as they're stealing cars and drive. And it's just like, oh, my gosh. And so, you know, we begin, we, we begin to pray for this, for this girl. And I don't remember. I'm pretty sure it was probably Rob. But Rob, Rob's like, dude, I mean, if you don't want Lil Wayne coming in here and tormenting you or the spirit of Lil Wayne coming in here and tormenting you and doing weird stuff to you, yeah, weird stuff, let's just keep it PG-13, to you, then you ought not be inviting Lil Wayne up in your house. And it's the same thing for you and I. Like, if you don't believe, you don't have to believe me if you don't want to. But listen, there's so much evidence in the higher levels of of music, the music industry. I know y'all think, man, this dude, hey, just, I was loving me some secular music when I was in the world. But I'm just trying to tell you right now, if you think that the enemy ain't got, got his claws up in that, and you feeding your spirit, man, these various things, and you wonder why you can't get free in some areas of your life, you might want to try to slow down and listen to the message that you're allowing to be played on the inside of you. And anyway, so, so here they are. These people don't know. They don't know because they've been living. And you, listen, there's some, and nowadays, if, you, if you're young, like the church that we used to go to, they wanted to be so cool and relevant. And I'm not trying to pick, dude. It is what it is. If you happen to be watching, you're probably not. It, this is just the truth. That, you know, they wanted to be so cool and relevant that I can remember one time, and boy, I love that dude. I still love you, by the way. But he was up there, and he said, listen, over there in youth group, the youth pastors teaching your kids in a language that they understand. Wicked, wicked, wicked. What was that? Oh, wicked, wicked, wicked. What kind of language is that? How's that going to help my, my, my brother's son walk in the Lord? Wicked, wicked, wicked. What is that? That's a, he's talking about a DJ spinning vinyl and, and, and throwing beats and doing whatever, what the world does. But it's cool, man. Everybody's into hip-hop. Let's get our little wiki, wiki, wiki going on, and let's go ahead and do a little rap song with some Christian lyrics, and let's just go ahead and, oh, yeah, let's, let's and listen, oh, Lord, help me. But let's change the lighting, and listen, I do, I personally feel like we need to change some of the lighting, but let's get some strobe, strobe lights. Let's get a little bit of smoke going on. Let's let, you know, I didn't tell y'all the story before Isabella said, Daddy, 
I'm feeling uncomfortable going to youth group. I personally feel like she had another agenda. But anyway, Lord, baby, forgive me if I'm wrong if you're watching. But I felt like she just had another agenda. I said, oh, really? She said, it's, it's more like the world than it is the church. I'm like, oh, okay. And I was on the board. See, that was their first mistake. <laughs> they nominated me to the board. So I go in there, and like when I first walked in, dude, the lights were way down. They had like some black lights up at the front, and they had this music. I don't know what it was. I'm guessing they're trying to tell me it was Christian. But all you could hear was a beat. like, Boom, 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 boom. And when I walk in, there's just this crowd of kids, and they just stand in there. Service hadn't even started yet. And I, I, I went back over there later, and I, and I confronted the dude. I'm like, bro, I said, look, this is the thing. You're preparing these kids to be comfortable in a club more than being comfortable in the church. He's like, what are you talking about, dude? He's like, everybody's doing this. I said, I don't care what everybody's doing. The whole church is messed up and doesn't even know where they're going. You ever, I said, this is the leaven of the Pharisee. It was leaven. I said, look, man, you need, to get, you need to put your message Bible down, and you need to get a literal translation, and you need to understand leaven is yeast, and it's a type of sin. And if you're bringing leaven into the church, you're bringing yeast into the church, you're preparing these people for lies. Listen, the church is bringing the world into itself, and we're wondering why nobody really knows the things of God anymore because, look, the book of the law has been lost. The word of the Lord's been lost. And, but it's not cool, preacher. I mean, people don't want to come in here and see you, like, yell at them and talk about all this stuff, all this technical stuff about the Bible. I don't care what people think is cool. Most of the time, the world's the one that's hurting, and they need to hear what we, Not most of the time. Let me redact that or change that. The world is hurting, and they're lost, and they need help. Amen? Now, will they all come? No, they won't. But are we going to change our story and our message to make them happy? No, we're not. Because that's not what the people of God do. Because the people of God desire to serve the Lord. And in order to serve the Lord, we must tell the truth about God to a lost and a dying world. All right. So there's a couple of scriptures that <coughs> bring us down the path. That kind of changed some things. I hope you can read these, okay? It says, and this is chapter 22, verse 8. We've already read it. And I want you to see this is a beautiful thing because this is kind of how it is with the word of the Lord too, you know. You get a hold of the word of the Lord. Somebody gets a hold of the word of the Lord. They read it, right, and it begins to change them. And then the next thing you know, they go to someone else and they begin to read it, right? And, I mean, I'm not trying to use other people's testimony, but my brother Wade, uh, he told me a story about how he got saved, and um, he told me, I mean, he did a little time, you know, but praise God, God delivered that brother, and, uh, and he used, God used him in Robert's life, but one of the first times he was incarcerated, some guy was trying to witness to him, and he's like, I'm, eh. and the guy was so persistent at one point in time, he said, look, can I just come read the Bible to you every morning? He's like, yeah, man, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. He said every morning, like clockwork, that dude would come and sit on the bunk, and he would just read the Bible. Day after day, day after day, until Wade got out. And some things happened, and the point is, is God showed up in the midst of his dad's house. Wade didn't know nothing about God other than the things that that guy had read to him. And when, he, and when the time was right, God awakened all of that stuff on the inside of him. So typically that's what happens. Somebody somewhere reads the word of the Lord, gets it on the inside of them, and then they begin to share the word of the Lord with someone else. Amen? And it says, Helkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan and the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord, and Helkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and look what it says, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Helkiah the priest has delivered me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. In verse 11, And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent or ripped his clothes. And then 2 Chronicles also says, And he wept. He ripped his clothes and he wept. That means when he heard the word of the Lord that the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit began to deal with his heart. 
while we're here, and I know y'all are being patient with me. I know I've used a lot of words already, and I'm sorry for that. I just have so much I want to say. But let me just say something real quick. If you ever are in a church service, and the preacher, whether it's me or someone else, is speaking about the things of God, and it happens to hit a spot that's in your own life, and you feel something that kind of digs in there a little bit, okay, sometimes the enemy will try to get you angry at what you heard, but sometimes, too, the conviction of the Lord will cause you to weep, okay? What I'm trying to say is this, is that don't get mad if you let, understand there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. See, Judas was condemned. He went out and he killed himself. Peter was convicted and he was restored. The Holy Spirit wants to bring us back off the wrong path and put us on the right path. That's what the, when the word of the Lord goes forward and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is behind it, the Lord will begin to convict us of things and show us things in our lives. And so when King Josiah heard the word of the law being read, he ripped his clothes and he began to weep. And then afterwards, look what it says. I don't know if you can read this or not, but it says, The king went up into the house of the Lord and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him and the priests and the prophets, all the people, small and great. Now, I want you to see this. So I can't remember their names right now. Hilkiah the priest gives it to Shaphan. Shaphan reads it. Shaphan goes back to the king, and Shaphan reads it to the king. Then now, the king, after he tore his clothes and he cleaned the, maybe cleaned the tears off of his eyes, he picks up the book of the law, and he says, Hey, everybody, meet me at the house of the Lord. And look what it says. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the, law, of the law, amen, which was found in the house of the Lord. Praise God. He read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. And so that's the title of my message this morning. Again, word of God speak, because when the word of God begins to speak to you, it will begin to minister to you. It will begin to give you understanding and revelation about the things of God. This is going to seem like a lot, but I promise you this is going to, I believe by God, this is going to move fast. But I got eight scriptures for you. I got eight scriptures about the word of God. The first one's going to come out of Proverbs chapter 7. Verses 1 through 3. The second one's going to come out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. The third one's going to come out of Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. The fourth one's going to come out of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The fifth one's going to come out of John chapter 17, verse 17. The sixth one's going to come out of Psalm 119, verse 105. The seventh one's going to come out of John chapter 8, verses 31 through 32, and the last one's going to come out of Matthew 7, 24 through 25. So here we go, Proverbs 7, 1 through 3. Now, I want you to also understand, if you happen to be taking notes, that I kind of was trying to find a main thought in each one of these little passages of Scripture. We're about to go to this one because it's a little too long for my PowerPoint, and I'm going to read it to you out of the Bible. But what I want you to know is, is that the Word of God needs to become part of you. Amen. When we're reading Proverbs 7, verses 1 through 3, I want you to understand that God wants the word of God to become part of you. Now, I guess that part of, one, part of what I'm saying is it needs to be part of who you are on the inside, but it's almost like some of this wording is like an accessory. On this little watch, every, I got to put it on the charger, and I, and I like this watch, so sometimes I forget it and I get aggravated, but I pretty re much remember that I try not to leave the house without grabbing it off the charger and put it in on my, putting it on my wrist, okay? And it's kind of like the word of the Lord amen? in that sense that that's what, the, that's what the, the, the communication is. Don't leave home without it. Let it become part of you. So let's read. My son, keep my words. Lay up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of your eye. Look, if, you were gonna, if I was going to go into the strongs on this, you know what the word apple of your eye means? It means your pupil. The, the word keep means to protect. Protect the word of the Lord like you would the pupil of your eye. Nobody just foolishly runs around jabbing stuff in the pupils of their eye. They don't want to lose their sight. They don't want to become blind. They would protect their, you're supposed to wear safety glasses when you work in the oil field, 
right? You're supposed to protect the pupil of your eye. The word of the Lord is, is, is so important. Amen. And he says, with the words of God, bind them upon your fingers. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine tying? It's like tying a string. You remember that? I remember when I was a, uh, I think I had to go to see a psychiatrist when I was, I did. I saw a psychiatrist. And now that I'm thinking about this, the psychiatrist's plan for me not to be mean to other people was I was going to tie a string on my finger. That was his plan. And when I was about to fuss at somebody or hit them or get angry, I was going to look at the string on my finger and it was going to remind me not to hit them or not to be mean. Okay. Anyway, that's ridiculous. But can you imagine? Could you imagine having the word of God tied to your fingers? What is, what is the point here? Oh, that sounds like a bunch of law. It is the law. But this is the point. Keep the word of God before your eyes. Make you're sure you understand and respect and love the word of God that it's always ever before you. Tie it to your fingers and also write it upon the table of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your kinswoman. Man, like, look at the word of God as though it's your relative. Amen? Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture, as we begin to put the word of the Lord on the inside of us, it begins to correct us. It begins to be like medicine that's healing us spiritually. I want you to understand, though, when you're thinking about this particular ver verse, I want you to understand breath of God, okay? Because, look, this word inspiration right here in the Greek language is Theo, which means God, neustos, which means breathe. Listen, some of y'all like, dude, you're using these fancy words. Okay, I'm about to break it down for you. Those of you that have worked with heavy equipment before, you ever heard of pneumatics? What is pneumatics? Pneumatic tools. What, what drives a pneumatic tool? Air. Air drives a pneumatic tool. Pneumo, pneumonia, air, lungs, breath, pneumonia, pneumo, neustos. God breathed. So the idea is, is talking about wind or breath. It's talking about air. But, but look, what, so, so it's God breathed. It's breathed by God in man, through man, to communicate to man the things that he needs for correction, 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 correction. This word is God breathed. And if you want the life of God on the inside of you, then you and I need to put the word of God on the inside of us. Hallelujah. And it's like in the New Testament, God's breathing his life through his word on the inside of us. Does it happen overnight? Nothing with God always happens. Very seldom does anything happen overnight. Yes, yeah, salvation is instantaneous. You can be changed in the blink of an eye. The rapture will happen in the blink of an eye when it takes place. Amen. But, uh, but hey, listen, for the most part, we got to stay in this. Amen. So there you go. That was the second one. Look, Matthew 4, 4. But he answered and said, it is written. Now, y'all remember this story, right? This is when the devil's trying to tempt Jesus. Jesus' response, it is said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of of the mouth of God. Now, I wanted you to see this. This is nutrition right here. I want you to understand that the word of God is like spiritual nutrition for you. Jesus said this. He said, Moses didn't give you the, ma the manna from heaven. My father gave you the true bread from heaven. This, my life is bread, and I will give my life for you. Amen. God, the, Jesus is the bread of life. He said, my, my flesh is true meat, my blood is true drink. Spiritually speaking, the word of God about Jesus feeds our spirit man and gives us the nutrition and the strength that we need in order to be able to grow in the things of God. Amen? Amen. Here's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, for the word of God is quick and powerful. I should have put a little insert right there. I want you to know. <laughs> that the word quick is an old King James word for alive. Y'all ever saw that movie, The Quick and the Dead? I know that's old. It's old Western. 
Now, now I just, this just hit me the other day. That was a, that's what you call a double entendre. That was a word play. What are you talking about? Because in the title of the book, it means quick. Like you, there's two kinds of people in the, in the movie. I'm, I'm using it as an illustration. There's the quick, and then there's the dead. Okay, get it? Gun, they were gunfighting. So you either you're quick or you're dead. But in that time frame, the word also meant alive. You see, so you're either alive or you're dead because you were either quick or you're dead. Does that make sense? But in here right here, the word quick means alive. So the word of God is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword and it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, the first thing I want you to see is, is that the word of God is like a mirror for the heart. I want you to see that. The word of God is like a mirror for the heart. Now, secondly, I want you to see this. This word discern, it's a discerner of the thoughts. The Greek word there is kritikos. It's where we get the word critical or critique. You know, sometimes when you hear the word critical, you automatically think about, man, that guy's critical. But, but sometimes being critical is to be inspecting and and to be discerning. Okay, women, y'all got one of them makeup mirrors? I can remember one time, the first time I looked in one of them ones, and my mom was like, oh, Lord, you see, right? I mean, you look, pull that thing up on you, you see how the pores, and you're like, oh, man, I don't want this one. Let me flip it over. Let me see what I look like from a distance, right? Because that's what, that's what those mirrors do. They're being critical. They're, they're critiquing so you can discern anything that's going on, blemishes and different things or whatever you got to do. That's part of what this word means. It's talking about inspection. The word of the Lord is cr critiques the inside. It gives us a mirror for the inside of our heart. This is powerful stuff, Christian, because look, this is the thing. I, I want to try to help you in your walk with the Lord. We all got stuff that we ain't supposed to have. And whenever you put the word of the Lord in you, the Lord will speak to you and show you your heart. Your job is not is to not, you don't have to come tell me about it. I mean, if you need somebody to talk to, I want to be here for you. But I'm just saying, you ain't got to come talk to me about it. But what you cannot do is ignore it. You cannot ignore what the Lord is trying to speak to you through his word. So you might be reading on passage of scripture somewhere and the Lord is, is nudging you in that area, he's trying to speak to you. He's critiquing that area of your heart. And the word of God is now playing as a mirror for your heart to show you yourself. And now how do you handle that? You bring it to the cross. Because the cross is an instrument of death. And God allows that thing to die to replace it with resurrection life. Amen? This word here, John 17 and 17, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So what I want you to understand about this right here is separation. Because you see, separation is one of the meanings of sanctify. Many of you know that. When I, for the many first years that I lived in, that I was in the church, People would say, you know, like it's say if somebody, um, for me, instance, when I used to still like dip a lot, I'd try to hide it as best I could, but every now and then they'd see me dipping, okay? Listen, first of all, let me just say this. It ain't God's will for you to be addicted to nicotine. It's just not because, number one, it's destroying your body. Number two, you don't probably really don't want to live with it. And number three, the Lord wants to deliver you from it because the truth is, is that you and I both know if you're anything like I was with the dipping, I mean, after about an hour and a half, two hours, I start getting ornery. And the next thing you know, like, I need a nicotine fix. Well, guess what? In some way, shape, or form, you're kind of in bondage to it. The Lord don't want you in bondage to nothing. Amen? Amen? So that's just some truth talk right there. But, but nevertheless, I would try to hide it because I didn't think it was right. But yet I would still shove this stuff in my mouth. And so what they'd say is, well, old man, he's just not sanctified yet. That's how they would say that. That's how they use it in the churches where people don't really understand the word of God enough to, to break it down. He just ain't sanctified yet. He's saved, but he ain't quite sanctified. But let me just tell you a little secret, my friend. When the day that you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in the mind of God, you are already sanctified because God put you in Jesus. And if you will stay plugged in to the Lord, he will progressively separate you out 
and sanctify you to where your life and your walk will begin to look more the way the Lord wants it than what it looked in the past. Amen? So don't let nobody judge you for where you are, but at the same time, don't get mad at the preacher for telling you the truth. Amen. So one of the things that I want you to know is, is this. It says, sanctify them. Who do you think the pronoun them is for? It's for you. It's for disciples. It's for those that are going to choose to serve God. Sanctify. Because he's. this is the Lord's prayer. He's about to go. And he's talking to his disciples specifically, but a disciple is a learner of Christ. So Jesus says, sanctify them. As a matter of fact, it's so real if you read the prayer in John 17. Jesus says, I'm not praying for them alone, but also for them that will believe because of their testimony. So what I'm trying to tell you is, that's talking about you, my friend. He says, sanctify them. Who? You. Sanctify them through your truth. What does that mean? Separate them, Lord. Separate them, believers, through your truth. When the truth of the Lord enters into your heart and it begins to change you on the inside, it's going to slowly but surely separate you from the rest of the world. You're going to start to realize that the things that you're doing that the Lord doesn't like, and he starts to take them away from you, I mean, take the desire away, and give you strength to walk a new path, then you're going to start looking less like the world and start looking more like the Lord, like Jesus. Amen? Praise God. Look at this right here, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. The word of God will give you direction. I'll put right here a GPS. Gives you direction. The Lord wants to give you to give you understanding on where to go. But look, Rob said something at the men's meeting yesterday. I know Rob didn't even know I was really listening, but it was good. He said a rudder. See, it's not only a GPS, but it's also a rudder, because a rudder on a boat will help you steer in the right direction. See, I need to know the destination, Lord but also need the Word of God to steer me, right? Whenever I realize I'm going off track, GPS pinpoint over here. My, my vessel's going this way. Oh, let me turn the rudder. Let me correct my course. Let me go into the right direction, amen? The Word of the Lord will show you where you need to go, and it will help you in your direction on how to get there, amen? We're going to go, we're going to, these are the last uh, two verses right here. And uh, John 8, 31 and 32, and then Matthew 7, 24 through 25. But what I want you to know is that in John 8, it's talking about freedom. I want you to see that. God wants to give you freedom this morning. And in Matthew 7, the idea is stability. So let's go to John 8, 31 first. We're about to close. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward if you don't mind. We'll close out the service with a song. Amen. We're going to worship the Lord together. Anybody needs prayer, the altars are open. Hallelujah. Come to him. He will fill you up. Amen. John 8, 31. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, See there? The word continue means to live in a place. It means to abide there. It means you don't just show up one day and quit the next. You got to continue in the word of the Lord. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. That's how you know a disciple. He's going to continue. It doesn't mean, hey, listen, by the grace of God, I took many a breaks from church, which I should not have done. My brother-in-law always used to tell me, Matt, you're doing the wrong thing. When you're doing bad with the Lord, you ain't supposed to run from the house of God. You're supposed to run to it. Amen? There's something, though, that whenever we're not doing right, we want to run away from the things of God. But what we're supposed to do is run toward the things of God. So continue in my word. Then you are my disciples indeed. Look at this. And you shall know the truth. Listen, this is not just read the truth. This is not just hear the truth one time. It's all part of that. Reading it. Hearing it is all part of it. But you shall know the truth. There's going to be a place whenever the word of the Lord is going to come on the inside of your heart and it's going to change you. Amen. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is the last verse. This talks about stability. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him 
unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. I just want you to know this morning, God's word provides stability for our lives. Amen? God's word provides stability for our lives. A rock, I know I used this illustration recently, a rock is something that just doesn't go away easily, especially them big ones. The winds can blow, the waves can hit it, but you wake up in the morning if you live on the coast and it's still right there. The rock doesn't go anywhere. The word of the Lord is the stability of God. You know, really and truly back in those days, they would dig down into the dirt until they could get to a place where they could find a rock and there they would use that as their foundation to build their house on. And so I want you to know that, that building your life on the word of God is like building a house on a rock, amen. It's a sure foundation. What does that mean in your life? It might mean different things to, you, to different people depending on our walk with the Lord, but I just wanna encourage you. Continue to put the word of the Lord in your heart. Continue to ask God to give you understanding and revelation. Allow the word of God to be the foundation that you build your life on. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. You're not going to get it all done your way, the way you want it. But in the end, you will be grateful for the things that God has done in your life. Amen. Let's worship the Lord and listen. If you need prayer this morning, come and seek the Lord.